Welcome, this is Chris, and on the show we are making games by year. Last time, we went back 50 years to the year of the first moon landing, and made our own version of the text-based lunar lander. This time, we're making another game from computing's Jurassic era, another text-based basic game made by a high schooler, a game you, the audience, voted for. That game is Star Trek. So what is this game, you ask, and why did people vote for it? This game is a text-based, turn-based game where you fly around the galaxy battling Klingons. It wasn't licensed or a commercial product, and it disseminated into gaming culture the same way other games of this vintage did, by being copied and cloned over and over freely. People voted for this game over other choices, including Oregon Trail, because this is a game everyone of a certain age who was into computer games would have grown up with. But why was this game notable enough to become so pervasive that decades after its original publication, people were still growing up with it and having fond memories of it later? One answer could be the gameplay. The basic gameplay format became a subgenre unto itself. This game also preceded or inspired later text-based dungeon crawler and roguelike games like Rogue, but this game came several years before D&D was even around as a tabletop game. This game had features like a procedurally generated galaxy map. The map is unknown until you explore or use your sensors, so the game may have also been the first computer or video game to feature a fog of war type of feature. You could also call the text-based map display a type of primitive tile-based graphics, just using ASCII art rather than pixel art. So the game had some novel gameplay innovations, which gives us some interesting features to implement in our own version. But is there more to it than that? Let's hear a little bit of history about the game and the author's own words, and maybe we'll find out. Back in 1971, I was a senior in high school. My school didn't have any computers, but I had managed to use read steal an account on a sigma 7 at university of california irvine i was trying to teach myself basic from a book at the time there was a program that ran on the vector graphics terminal on the sigma 7 that was a simple shoot 'em up space war style game i wanted to make a game like that but i only had access to an asr 33 teletype non-video terminal hey there is only so much i could use in high school this was back when star trek was really hot a bunch of my other geek friends from high school and I spent a lot of hours brainstorming what we could do if we didn't have a video terminal. Since I was the only one in the group that had any knowledge of computers, as little as it was, we ended up coming up with a lot of unimplementable ideas. One idea that did stick was the idea of printing a galactic map and a star map to give you some idea of what to shoot at, and having phasers reduce power exponentially like they would if they shot in all directions. It may seem pretty simple now. But for a bunch of high school kids in the early 70s, it seemed pretty cool. The program went through dozens and dozens of iterations, mainly over the summer after we graduated. I didn't have any disk space allocation, so I had to punch a paper tape each day when I finished and load it back in again the next day. Working on 10 characters per second terminal forced me to keep the program really small. Otherwise, I probably would have gone crazy adding feature after feature. So Mayfield wanted to create a game like Space War, which was all the rage in computer circles back then, such as they were. His computer, lacking a display, could not run Space War, so cleverness and necessity explains the gameplay innovations. But he set out to make a Space War clone and ended up with Star Trek. What's the significance of that? And what's the connection between Star Trek and gamers? Nerds have always loved Star Trek, and they've always wanted to feel like they're in Star Trek and live out their fantasies of being in the captain's chair on a starship. The computer was a futuristic, utopian machine that let Trekkies step into that world. I grew up playing this Star Trek game with my dad. I played several derivative versions of this game throughout my childhood that I didn't even remember until researching this video. Later on in college, my friends and I would throw parties just to play Artemis. And now you have options like Star Trek Bridge Crew in VR. Star Trek, itself pitched as Wagon Train to the Stars, was certainly a worthy successor to the pulpy sci-fi that inspired Space War in the first place. But it was so much more. 
I could go on all day about what made the show special at the time it came out, or compared to its peers, but over half a century later, none of those reasons can explain it so well as simply saying that Star Trek created some basic need in nerd culture that this game was simply the first to fill. It began a rite of passage more significant than, and far outlasting, any specifics of genre or technology. But I do think it's helpful to consider the state of Star Trek as a franchise when Mayfield wrote his game. The show is now a staple franchise in geek culture, and the show always had a rabid fan base of Trekkies, whose achievements included successfully getting the series renewed for a third season with a mass letter writing campaign and literal picketing. But the show had inauspicious beginnings nonetheless. It was always mediocre in the ratings and had been off the air for two years when Mayfield made his game. During this time, however, the show's legend continued to grow as reruns of the show and syndication reached a whole new and often younger audience. These new fans would pour over all the details of the episodes and become part of the show's devoted following. By January of 1972, you had the first major Star Trek convention in New York. 500 were expected to show, but over 3,000 attended. By this point, there were also over 100 fanzines about the show. It was only natural that these Trekkies would gather and discuss the show and create and share fan works as a way to keep this universe they loved so much alive when corporations weren't quite sure what to do with it. Mayfield's game wasn't the first computer game based on Star Trek, and there would be unrelated computer games based off of Star Trek written after. It was one of several games, all of which themselves were part of the broader tradition of early Star Trek fan works. This game succeeded because Mayfield invented a formula that really worked and happened to be in the right place and right time for it to be widely disseminated and iterated upon through the mechanisms of the collaborative proto-open source culture of the early computer movement. So let's talk about how that happened. Late that summer, I bought HP's first programmable calculator, the HP 35. I ended up going down to the local sales office several times for help on the programming. One time they mentioned that I could use their computer if I would convert my Star Trek program to their computer so that they could use it. Since their basic variant was so different from the basic on the Sigma 7, and the program had gotten pretty messy by then from all the changes, I ended up just doing a rewrite. The program was added to HP's public domain library, which is where Dave all got it. Star Trek was added to the HP library in February of 1973. From there it was discovered and the source code was printed in the People's Computer Company newsletter. It was also discovered by employees of the education department at a computer company called DEC. David All, whom we've mentioned on the show before, and fellow DEC employee Mary Cole ported it to DEC's own version of BASIC and distributed it in the company's educational newsletter. This version was later printed in All's book 101 Computer Games under the name Space War. When All eventually left DEC to start Creative Computing Magazine, he discovered and published an expanded version called Super Star Trek by Bob Leadham. Super Star Trek also made it into the second edition of All's book in 1978, which was published right as the home computer revolution was taking off and became the first computer book to sell over a million copies. Back then, and through much of the 80s, it was common for programs to be distributed as code listings in books, magazines, and newsletters that the user would actually sit and type in. It seems absurd now that anyone would spend the time to do this, but in those days there wasn't such a divide between programming a computer and simply using one. Programs were also super short compared to even the simplest games today, and computer space notwithstanding, the idea of a commercial video game industry, or even computer software as some copyrightable product that you could pay for, had yet to develop, so code was usually just shared freely. This is just how things were done before the internet, or even floppy disks were widely available. If you still want to play it today, the basic version of Super Star Trek is playable via Vintage Basic. There's also BSD Trek, which is a C port of a Fortran rewrite of Mayfield's original game. It's still included in the Debian Classic Unix games package. If I were to talk about all the forks, ports, rewrites, and derivatives of this game, I would be here all day, but let's cover a few notable ones. 
The Starfleet series started in the 80s and was a successful commercial derivative of the formula. Star Raiders on Atari Systems was a version of the game reimagined with first-person real-time combat. Star Raiders itself was hugely influential and is sort of the missing link between the original Trek game and other games like Wing Commander and Elite, the latter of which is still a franchise going on to this day. It became something of a tradition that every time the game changed hands, the programmer or designer would add a new feature or otherwise put their own spin on the game. My hope is that in making my own version for this show, It'll both be my own small contribution to this tradition, and also act as my invitation to you to enter this world. Thanks for watching. Hi all, this is just part one of three parts for this episode. I decided to serialize the show, and then combine the parts for each episode when they're all out. That way, you can watch them separately or all at once. For the next episode, our choices for the next game we make are Pong and the Magnavox Odyssey. I'll describe these games at the end of part 3, but if you already have a preference, feel free to start voting in the comments now. In the meantime, check out the game, the tutorial video, and the GitHub for the Star Trek game, all in the description below. In the spirit of the original game, I'd love to see all the feedback and modifications you can come up with. See you next time!